Awesome. So welcome to those of you who are joining us for this live Facebook conversation today on why assess ministry even in a moment when things are crazy. I'm Jessica Tate. I'm the director of Next Church. And along with me today is Siobhan Starling Lewis, who is a pastor in Huntersville, North Carolina, and also a member of the Next Church strategy team and a lover of all things related to cultivated ministry. So we are excited to be talking today about cultivated ministry and why it matters even in this time of um, and a difficult moment in the life of the church and of our country. We are on Facebook Live today, so we'll be watching the comments and questions as they come in, and we'll try to weave those into what we say in the next um, little while. And a huge thanks to the Presbyterian Foundation for some grant money that has allowed us to create some additional resources to go alongside the cultivated ministry resource that we have. So with that, Siobhan, I will turn it over to you. What is cultivated ministry? Thanks, Jessica. Um, well, cultivated ministry is um, something that births out of Next Church, as you know, uh, and it is an opportunity to think with intention around how to assess our ministries while they're up and going and also afterwards. It's a great tool that I found that works at any kind of stage in which a ministry may find itself. Um, it consists of four interlocking parts that are all ways of assessing ministry faithfully. Um, and they are storytelling, learning, accountability or mutual accountability, as well as theology. So, um, and for each of those, um, it's an introduction into how to not do, do the ministries, but make sure that they are attending to these particular ways of being, because in doing so, there's a formative aspect of being church together um, that is truthful. So thinking theologically means really weaving in and being able to name where God is calling the church to do the work and to be the church together. Um, storytelling is really about the ability to witness and to tell the truth about what we're seeing and experiencing and to recognize where those stories are interwoven with the stories that are larger narrative of uh, our Christian witness in the world um, and of who God is calling us to do as we think about what the reign of Christ coming into the world looks like. Um, and then a mutual accountability is actually one of my favorites because it flips a phrase and a thought that usually makes people really uncomfortable. Usually um, when I've shared this with my other congregation, it was amazing to watch the light bulb go on that accountability is about criticism. It isn't about deriding each other. It isn't about breaking things down, but it is about building up community in ways where trust can be possible, truth are flourishing, hope is possible, um, and we're actually willing to say, I see you and allow ourselves to be seen. Um, and then learning, I find to be, again, a game changer to think about our ministries in terms of how do we do ministry so that we're popping ourselves in ways that we are in um, an interest of growing and learning and developing. So even when something doesn't necessarily meet what we had hoped um, depending on what our assessment tool might have been that we were using to hold ourselves accountable, there's always an element if you've been asking questions all along with a learning posture to prepare yourself better for whatever the next chapter looks like. And I found that that has also just been a place where people's hearts have been released from a place of like perfecting and trying to get it right um, to getting it faithful and making sure it's fruitful um, because those are things that you don't get right those are things that you live into. Um, and that's, I think, a, the key part of being a learner in general and one of the gifts of this particular part of the assessment tool. Um, and so for those who may not know, that tool is made available. There is a field guide. There's also additional resources that are being developed, including this uh, conversation right now. Um, but it's available through the church's website. So you are, and it's free. And uh, we really want um, for the church to know that this is a gift we're thinking about how we do the work together. Um, we are blessed to be in this time. I hope that's a, a clarifying um, introduction. Feel free again if you want to leave a comment and, uh, about. We're, I'm glad to break down more of those pieces. Um, but we were we were introducing this time together as kind of five simple reasons why it's worth to assess even when things are 
completely unhinged or untethered or crazy or just feeling like it's just too much. Um, and one of those is I think if you lean to the invitation to assess, and I, I wanna talk just a moment about the idea of assessment. Um, you usually hear that word and it sounds like it's a critique already, but assessment is really taking seriously the call to be steward. And a part of that is looking at what we have so that we can be as faithful with it as possible. Um, God has endowed us, called us in our identities as people from the beginning in our Christian, in our biblical story of stewards of the land and steward of the resources. And it takes a, an invitation for God to lead us in order for us to know how to use those faithfully. And, and part of that is assessment. It's saying, are we moving in the right direction or not? Are we, are we, are the signs and the signposts saying, yes, you're, you're accomplishing what it is God would have you do, or are you getting information that's telling you the opposite so that you can reevaluate either what you're doing or how you're feeling called to do it? Um, and so one of the, um, the gifts of clearing uh, of this, of uh, slowing down in the middle of what feels like, I've, in this season, I've talked to a couple people about what I feel in this moment, and it's that scene in the Wizard of Oz in which the tornado is actively happening, and Dorothy's like, ooh, there goes a witch, ooh, there goes the house, and if she would have tried to hold on to the witch or tried to hold on the house, she would have been even, even more turmoil. Um, I find that there's kind of like this buzz that is happening. And when I slow down for any particular ministry uh, to assess it, there's a gift of just clearing that fog um, and, and getting my eyes a little bit um, reset so that I'm able to, to, to move from a space that isn't anxious, that isn't about the quick fix, that isn't um, losing sight of the larger work that we've been working on as a congregation or even, you know, when we have some cultivated ministry that still blows my mind is that yes, you can use it for your church's ministry, but you can also look at your own personal use as a steward of time and energy you have. Um, and it's so, it's so amazing that you can slow down and just remove some of the mist um, that kind of clouds our, our thoughts in the middle of crisis. Because in reality, you are thinking about that first, the next thing to do and we're kind of in the middle of it. And we don't know what our end will look like when it comes to this current COVID situation or usually any other crisis that you're in the middle of as a church. Um, but in the middle of it, you can take that deep breath and you can attend to a way of assessing that reminds you, oh, our ultimate call as we've named in the past or that we're currently naming is towards a certain goal. Um, and that feels more settling and it feels like turn to the kind of the spirit of God that's within us that moves in that way. Um, yeah, that's what I've discovered is like, it's a huge value. It lets you know what matters most. You're not just moving uh, in a buzz, but gives you some time to, to move towards the why you're doing it. That sometimes in the middle of a chaos, honestly, it's just hard to, to grab a hold of. So um, that's the first thing that comes to mind is that it just clears the fog. That's great. I, that, as you're talking, it makes me think that we're usually not very good at stopping to assess or evaluate at all. But if we do it, we usually wait till after the fact and then say, how did that go? Um, as if it's all linear. And what you're really inviting us into is along the way, let's be learning and growing and revisiting um, so that it's it's less of a static linear thing and more of a where are we in this moment? Are we doing what we said we wanted to do? Why or why not? And there may be good reasons why not. Maybe we need to adapt along the mm -hmm, way. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But getting that, like constantly- And there may be th things we genuinely just need to sit down, right? We just like, we can't carry everything when you're in the middle of it, but to have some intentionality about what you're carrying and what you are saying, no, intent, intent. So you're not grieving that everything isn't happening the way it is. There's just a groundedness that happens when you're willing to engage assessment. Um, 
that removes a huge amount of, of anxiety um, and allows you, like one of the things that comes to mind too is like within cultivated ministry, we have this idea of um, impact statements. Um, and it's, it's the idea that um, with any ministry, and this is actually a, a gift, a game changer uh, for any act, like you can name it for an activity or even like the reason why a ministry exists. But being able to have a clear so that statement or an impact statement, in essence, an example is um, you have a personnel committee so that, and there are many different reasons why you make a personnel committee, but having it out loud so everybody's on the same page, totally a game changer. And having the system be able to be accountable to each other in that sense of like, Oh, it's not so that we can reprimand people when they say things that we don't like. Oh, okay. <laughs> but instead, it's like, for example, that I mean, I've heard people that possibly might have been the case. Um, but like, but oh, the building up of the kingdom so that we can equip um, our leaders with the tools that they have and they feel encouraged for the work that they're doing to the church or for the church. Um, like it, it really is a game changer to be able just to have that simple so that it's almost, it's like, it reminds me of algebra. It's like super mathematical, but in a way that is super transformative. Like if you can get the equal sign, we're doing this with the intent, with the hope for impact of, man, things get like the fog moves very quickly because then you realize there's many, many ways to get to that impact. So that if we can't do it the way we were doing it before, what is it that God has given us in order to do it in the current situation? That's great. So the first reason to assess in a, in a time of pandemic is because it helps us to clear the fog and bring some clarity about what we most value. Mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. So another reason is that assessment helps remember that we care about people over process. Um, and there's obvious theological reasons why that matters, that we can um, very quickly get into the, the weeds of things and the logistics of things and forget that people are the most significant treasure that we have. Um, so taking a moment to assess and be again clear that we're stewarding our resources the way that we want to the way that we value to put people in at the forefront is a really important thing one of the biggest learnings from cultivated ministry as a whole for me was that um, we talk in cultivated ministry about different layers of um, of how things happen that we have needs that our desires wants um honest to goodness needs. And then we have inputs that are all of the resources we put toward meeting those needs. And then we have outputs, which is what did we get from our inputs as we put them toward those needs. And then lastly, what was the impact of that whole process? Um, and one of the most important learnings for me through cultivated ministry has been that the church is an input, that the church is gathering our resources to try to impact a need, but that we're doing that because we want something else to happen and we want it to have an impact in God's evolving world. So we, um, and I think that that idea was so um, revolutionary for me because I think I often thought that the church was the end. And as soon as somebody pointed that out, I was like, oh my gosh, right. The church is not the end. The church the kingdom of God is the end and the church is. Well, and it's a game. I'm so with you. I'm so with you. Like it was a game changer to really let that sit in the spirit. Because I think part of our form process is that we see church as a, as a goal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think so much of our leadership seems like church as we're going to have church on Sunday, which we are, that is getting blown up in so many ways as to what that looks like currently. Um, but then you realize, oh, this is actually just an output to point us towards what the actual goal is. It's a game changer. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So right now I think a lot about the, um, 
you know, we're all scrambling to figure out how to do worship virtually. And it's really easy to get into thinking that worship is the point when really the impact we're for, it's not about worship in and of itself as an act. It's about that worship connects us to God and to one another and transforms us as disciples of Jesus Christ. So that's the impact we're trying to have. And then that totally opens it up to, well, if that's how we're trying to engage people um, and connect them with God, then well, we, we can do that in a sanctuary on Sunday morning in pews with an organ, or we can do that over Zoom, which we're all figuring out, or we could do that in 50 million other ways. So just, it opens up the possibility um, when we keep people, fo people focused over process along the way. So one of the tricks mm -hmm. I like to use to try to um, help myself with this is to check out my calendar sometimes and figure out where I am spending my time. Cause that's really where the rubber hits the road on this for me is that I can look at all of the administrative tasks on my to-do list and all the meetings that get scheduled in my calendar and then go, when did I actually stop and pay attention to people and what they're needing, what they're wanting, um, what's breaking their hearts right now, where they're anxious, um, where they're hopeful, where they're energized and trying to connect all that together. Um, that's a really good check for me on whether I am holding people up over process. So we've got clearing the fog yeah, over process. Do you mind? Oh yeah, jump in, yeah. Well, and one of the things like, I think one of the gifts of cultivated ministry is because it's built on um, community organizing model, that it has this innate attention to relationship that I think um, it just a great undergirding because at every corner you're seeing, yes, but evaluate in community. Yes, but think theologically so that we may be able to understand how it is operating. Like there's just this amazing shift from the individualistic understanding of leadership and um, uh, or, or even kind of being a, a person in the church uh, to one that does involve us and invite us to deeply be together um, at every turn, particularly the mutual accountability too, because you realize you know, you're not alone in this. You shouldn't be alone in this. If you're finding that you're alone in this, it may be that um, we've, we've missed an opportunity to think about how we're doing church together. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so we've got clear the fog, we've got people over process. And then a third reason to assess in this moment is to find the wonder of worship. Everyone mm. has been forced to totally rethink and remake how we are doing worship right now, which has forced us some to assess why we worship and how we worship simply because we can't do it the way that we're used to. And that is having an impact on us and opening up some really creative space for a co-creation of what um, what may be coming and what, what is coming and what may, what may be becoming. That's an awkward sentence. Yes. <laughs> so, but now that the, the it was perfectly fine. <laughs> <laughs> now that the form of worship isn't the one that we're used to. We are going back again to that why question of why do we worship and how then can we best connect to God and one another um, going back to the function of worship and the, again, get it, clearing that fog. Um, and we're getting to use our creative muscles and it's a great time to assess what, where are the pieces of our worship service that are allowing people that connection to each other, that connection to God, that experience of the holy, that transformative power of our faith. Um, we're getting to exercise our creative muscles and everything's kind of up for grabs in that right now, because we're not um, bound by what has traditionally been the norm. So one of the ways I am eager to be practicing this right now, and we're the wor little worship team that I've been on for the last eight weeks is actually going to get together and do this next week to celebrate together. What are the joys of worship that we've discovered as we've been forced to do it in a very different way? And I'm so excited for that conversation because I think regardless of what happens next, those insights are gonna be really helpful to us, whether we get to go back into our sanctuary, whether we don't, whether we're doing a hybrid model, like whatever the future has, we have discovered some things about where there's joy and meaning 
in worship and we get to wonder about that and then be creative about how do we lift those things up um, even as we maybe return to some of the forms we're more familiar with. So that's the third yeah, one. I think covering the wonder in worship as a particular. I think place. there's something like, there really is something like um, remarkable about discovering together. Mm -hmm. um, and to, yeah, there's just a joy that happens. It doesn't matter where, like, it's like going to a new place uh, that you, like, it's always better to go to a new restaurant with someone that you can then share that experience with, or a movie. And because there's something about that communal, we're now making a story together. This is now, regardless of where our churches have been in the past, we are in a unique time that we will remember, and it will be a part of our each congregation, each worshiping body's DNA going forward is how did we respond? How did we celebrate, discover, try, breathe through, even grieve? this process of co-creating something new um, and knowing that like that's going to be an imprint on how we see ourselves going forward. I, I cannot imagine a world uh, where we go back completely as if it hasn't happened because that's not how learning happened. Like we have been changed um, for, for ways that are remarkably um, unsettling in some spaces to be perfectly honest and also remarkably joyful in others because some people are being invited to be in the center of the space that have been marginalized previously because new skills um, are being developed uh, and are needed and I just think that it, it's phenomenal. Yeah you're saying that makes me think um, I'm noticing every time I'm touching my face right now in time to Candomic. I did watch me too. I feel like the same. Well, um, but that makes me think of the you are naming that um, there's there's that joy in finding the new things, and it also I think is instructive right now. What are we most grieving that we're missing from being in the form we had been for so long? Because that's also really instructive. Of if we're really missing, I mean, one of the things I'm missing the most is singing with other people. Um, so what is, and then it gives us an opportunity to really wonder about that. Well, what is it about that act of communal singing that has such value for me, for us collectively? And are that once we get to those values that gives us an opportunity then to think about, well, are there other ways we could meet that need if it can't be in congregational singing for the foreseeable future? Um, so it's also a way to yeah. see what is bringing joy, but also what we're grieving and then going underneath that to figure out if there's ways that we can meet those needs in this disruptive time. Yeah, there, there's a gift in just knowing that it's in, it is learning, it is discovery. Um, whatever the sensation, like there is a truth that we can witness to and we can tell the story of if we slow down together and say, and actually ask like, what is it that we're experiencing? Because it's there's going to be a diversity too, mm -hmm. um, and holding tension for the reality of like the very same thing that someone is rejoicing is not there is the very same thing that somebody else may be grieving is not there. Exactly. Um, and so even to have space to hear each other is a powerful, powerful thing. Absolutely. All right, I'm going to bring us to the fourth thing that we belong mm -hmm. to each other. That's the um, fourth reason to assess in a moment of pandemic um, is that reality that has become so starkly clear to us, given the nature of this virus and how it spreads that we really, we, we like to think that we are islands unto ourselves sometimes, but we really are not. We are all interconnected. Um, and one of the beautiful things I think we're seeing right now is for the most part, we care for one another. We care about the well-being of one another. Um, and we're seeing that come out in really beautiful ways right now. And that there's also um, an accountability, a mutual accountability to each other, that the choices I make right now about being out, being in public, going shopping, all of those things and the way in which I do that has a significant impact on other people's livelihood like not their profession, but their literal beinghood. Um, yep. And so we are account, we're seeing so starkly right now, the accountability that we have to each other that we can often um, hide. So 
I think the other interesting thing that's happening right now is we're seeing, um, we're finding connection necessary so that we're not isolated. Um, so we're, we're finding creative ways to connect with each other. Um, and they're often imperfect. It's, you know, it's much more fun to sit down at dinner with you and Kirk than to talk to each other over Zoom, but you know, we're gonna do what we can do um, here. So seeing all those connections, all of that accountability to each other, all of the, the ways that we can be um, supportive and mutually supportive of one another. It's, it's allowing us to see, I think right now the, um, we're sort of testing the, the strength of our web right now, the interconnected web that we all have. And we're also seeing the places where that web is really weak and needs some tending. We're seeing the, the places where um, people are, are falling through the cracks, falling through the, the cracks in the web. Um, one of the ways I am thinking about that very practically for ministry right now is thinking about, again, the part of the mutual accountability there is who is on the team and um, how have we redefined who the team is in this moment? Um, has the team expanded? Mm -hmm. Has it shifted? Are we needing different kind of skills? Um, whose voice isn't being heard that sh needs to be heard? So it's it's inviting us in a very practical level to think anew about who the team is that's carrying out a ministry and how that can shift and expand for this particular moment and time. Um, that's another piece of how we belong to each other. And it, I think it, it helps with that. It helps as an antidote to what often happens in the church where it's the usual suspects that are carrying out all of the things all of the time and they're tired often. And, um, but yes. we don't know who else to call upon. So this is a good moment to, to lean on those interconnections and figure out who else could be part of this team. How can it shift and expand in this particular moment? Yeah, it feels, uh, yeah, yes, I'm, totally agree it feels like there because everything is up in the air some things are landing differently mm -hmm. um, when it comes to how we see that we're connected with each other and how we see who who may be called to have those particular gifts come forward that thought well eventually we might need that gift or eventually we could possibly so eventually went to today we need that gift because <laughs> we really want to it's this impact that we we believe in the the previous way of doing it, it is not going to cut it. Um, and and again, like to be honest, like that's probably if if we are in full conversation with each other, that's exciting at some level. And there probably is some grief, like someone's feeling displaced, someone's feeling um, replaced, maybe. Uh, and to get a better clarity and saying like, oh, well, actually the gift of this time is to reconnect to the fact that our team can look more diverse than it ever did before. Because now we realize we have an even wider uh, collection of skills that can attend to that impact. It's a game changer. It is, it is realizing that God has given us plenty um, versus the scarcity that usually leads to what you were originally describing just now of a few people doing all the work, that 80-20 thing that we say, and I'm not really sure it's true, but we definitely say that, you know, 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work. Um, it, it, for us to, 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 to pay attention to what's being shaken up and see it as an expanding um, could, could offer some huge fruit in the future. Um, and so the fifth and the final um, reason why it's worth it to assess right in the middle is for the sake of leadership. Um, leaders have the ability and the gift of moving people through hard and unknown things. And we don't often know how well we lead until something happens that we are called to lead through. Um, and we have the opportunity together. One of the things that's been amazing is to watch leaders come alongside leaders to offer best practices, things that they saw either blow up or, or completely fly high um, the weeks before or, uh, or the things that they really wanna try, but has, have you tried a liturgy for communion 
that is virtual. Can you share your best practices? Um, the ability to develop as leaders and to know that leadership looks very different and that there are diverse ways of leader, leading that, um, that we, we haven't done a good job, to be perfectly honest, as the church um, supporting. We haven't always done a good job of, of expanding what we understand leadership to be. Um, and we're in this space where we can finally um, glean some of the gifts that have been sitting dormant, I believe. Uh, and as we're continuing, continuing to grow together. And there is trust that comes after you've gone through some stuff. And I can attest to this in many ways. Um, when you walk through things with others, um, there's a, a sense of connectedness and uh, truthfulness. Um, the I, I not only say something, but I'm showing that in the middle of when it would have been easiest to turn away from that, that is still how I'm going to be as a leader, um, is a game changer for everyone because you see the very core of what's moving people for the good and the bad. I'm not gonna say it's all good because um, that would be dishonest, um, but I think a lot of beautiful leadership is um, coming forth in this season where we could just feel um, mobilized by fear, or we could just be so anxious that we revert back on everything just so that it's the easiest thing that we know to, or we're just gonna do it the way we've always do it to that greatest extent. Um, but instead, we're finding leaders that are inviting their communities to say, let's take a deep breath together. Let's um, look at the gifts that we have around the table. Let's look at the experience we have around the table. Um, and, they're, and they're being invited to use those creatively. I, I, I started, as you know, at a new church here in Huntersville. Um, and I was, I think my installation was like two weeks prior to us going down this lockdown here in North Carolina. And I'd been here for maybe a month or so before the installation. And it's been amazing to discover that there's a space for these gifts that I may have around technology or helping the church move to an online format, which hadn't existed at all. Um, and I know, um, that there's ways in which as a leader, this is a part of the story that folks are developing around how can I get through, like pastors should be trusted to show up even when things are hard. Um, and I'm learning that about my leaders, that they are showing up in remarkable ways and I'm getting to root for them and support them and celebrate their gifts. Um, and yeah. And like I mentioned before with the idea, like, yes, this feels great in some spaces, but also not with a sense of, um, not with a sense of um, doom, but like also recognizing that that's also a grief, that this will upset some apple carts. Um, uh, but in, at the end of the day, we are seeing the abundance of God. We are seeing the reign of God come close to us in ways that it hadn't or as we see the abundance that's possible in community. Uh, and so one of the ways of putting this idea of leadership, uh, being able to be assessed and celebrated um, in this season is personally um, to acknowledge what new gifts you discovered in your community um, and what new gifts have you discovered personally within yourself? Um, what are the things that um, you, like, I did not know I would be able to show up like that. Or, wow, we are showing up and doing God's work, even though we would not have imagined that it would have been able to have this impact that it is happening right now. Um, like, and I like for our, our church, go from a small church where we maybe had 30 in worship to doing an online service. And on average, there's about 200 people that are impacted by our ministry throughout the week um, with the online service. That feels like I never would have imagined that there could be a way in the first couple months in a, in a new ministry where we could have such a, in a, an impact 
development. Now, I am not a fan of COVID. I am not saying we get more COVID in the world. <laughs> Let me be very, very clear. Um, I think about loved ones who have lost loved ones. I think about loved ones who have physically, um, who are themselves have been affected and infected by it. And so I don't minimize what is happening in our society and what is happening physiologically to the body of Christ as people are suffering and grieving. Um, and at the same time, by God's grace alone, I think there are gifts to be discovered in community and as individuals um, as we lead through these times. Um, so yeah, I think that that's um, the fifth idea of reason why it's worth to assess is, is to have a clarity around your leadership. Um, and to be able to celebrate in the middle, there's so many scriptures, there's psalms about what it means to know that God can turn your mourning into dancing. God can turn that very space and it doesn't minimize that the morning is morning, um, but there's really space to celebrate that God is still a God of provision, even in the midst of it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm grateful for it. So just so, oh, I'd like recap the five that we've gone through, simple reasons why it's worth assessing. Um, one is that it clears the fog. Um, and a practical way that you can uh, engage them would be considering to write an impact statement for one of the ministries that you either assist with or lead, um, or one even that you're um, thinking about doing coming forward. Um, secondly, that it by assessing in the middle, you can make sure that you're choosing people over process. And that uh, practical way in which Jessica offered to do that and how she's been thinking about it is look critically at your calendar. How are you spending your time prioritizing who you're reaching out to and touching bases with, particularly as people are navigating this space socially and emotionally and psychologically and spiritually. Um, number three, finding the wonder in, in worship. Um, as worshiping people, um, this is primary our primary part of our identity is as worshipers. Um, and one way that we've been thinking about to practice this on the ground is to celebrate what are some of the joys that you've discovered in worship in this time where it's not been the normal. Um, and then another uh, reason to assess is that we belong together. And this epidemic situation, this uncertainty is teaching us that in a very deep way. Um, we can recognize that while it's happening, we don't have to wait till it's over. Um, and one practical way of recognizing that is to um, take some time and name, has your team been redefined by this situation? Has it expanded? Has it shifted? What do your ministry members look like? Um, and how are they operating differently in these days? And lastly, uh, a gift of uh, looking particularly in this time is uh, attending to what your leadership is doing and being and what your personal leadership is experiencing as well as the community's leadership at large and taking a moment to really evaluate and celebrate again some of the gifts of what God has given you or made available that you've discovered in this time. Um, we invite you uh, as Next Church is continuing to develop some new resources around cultivated ministry. If you are interested in joining a small group that's uh, engaging the work of cultivated ministry, um, you are welcome to reach out. You can reach out through the messenger on uh, Next Church's uh, Facebook page, if that's the easiest way, as well as you are welcome to reach me by email. Um, and I'll include my email in the comment section, but that's Siobhan.Starling, S-T-A-R-L-I-N-G dot Lewis, uh, L-O-U-I-S at gmail.com. Um, there are also additional videos around cultivated ministry that are found on our website. There are more videos as well as like um, some things that are helpful just to share with your community um, that are quick little words about cultivated ministry, um, quick little gifts of uh, phrases, um, one that explains what an impact statement is, one that names, as Jessica said so clearly, that the church is an output, not uh, all by itself uh, has its own purpose, but it is a gift to be able to, a, excuse me, the church is an input towards the impact that we're called to do as God's people. 
Um, and this idea of why it's worth it to uh, analyze your ministry? Why is it worth to assess your ministry? Uh, there is going to be a work that's coming out on the website in the next couple weeks um, that kind of pulls all of these ideas together as well. Um, we invite you to join the Facebook page that is Cultivated Ministry in Practice um, as um, a way of keeping up with these resources as they are unrolling. Um, and we invite you to reach out to Next Church. Uh, again, nextchurch.org, you can get the current version of the field guide, but we are working to add additional resources there. Jessica, can you think of anything else? No, I think that's great. <laughs> Well, it has been a blessing to talk to you, spend time with you, um, and to share some of the gifts of why it's worth it to assess right in the middle. Um, and uh, we genuinely, we prayed before we start, but know that it is our hope that these will be uh, blessings for, for your ministries wherever you find yourself. Um, and I'm just grateful that we've been able to have this time together. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you. See you later. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>